everyone, this is George Kroos with my wonderful co-author, Allison Apsey. We're talking What Makes a Great Principal. I'm going to show this right here. What Makes a Great Principal, you get that book. It is in the description down below. Um, if you haven't read it, if you have read it, this is kind of uh, meant to be kind of digging deeper. We're trying to add some, provide some added value, just kind of talking about some of the elements that we did in the book. So if you didn't actually see it the last few weeks, and we've been wearing the same clothes for the last few weeks, haven't changed once right so maybe next it's week we'll to change. To make in the morning. maybe next week we'll change. <laughs> so we talked about we we're talking about the five pillars over these five weeks and the first pillar we talked about is relationship builder uh, the second one is continuous learner and the third one that we're talking about today is talent cultivator and i, I think you know and this is a conversation alice and i had uh it's not like build relationships then <laughs> learn continuously then you can cultivate talent. It's all kind of, you know, there's, there's always times you can spend time on any of these things, right? And maybe identifying, you know, what you're really good at, where you need to grow. And this actually might tie in a little bit to your conversation, what you shared um, that you're gonna talk about um, in this session too. And we kind of like have some like brief pre-conference before we actually share this. But we hope that um, you kind of find some extra value here. And before I get into talent cultivator, ask Allison, her question because we want to share some insights. Um, I've been asking the question for the last three years, um, who, who's a teacher inspired you? Who's an administrator inspired you? And what advice would you give for, to your first year teacher self? And the interesting thing on the administrator question is I typically always get a variation of this answer. They saw something in me that I did not see in myself. I see it over and over again, is that this person, said you should go do this thing i never thought i should do this thing and then i started doing it and i was like it's just over and over again and that's what they connect to and i i this is the this is my like red flag question you know like i don't know if you've seen the TikTok red flag thing mm -hmm. is that when i say to a, a teacher hey what do you like about your principal oh they just get out of my way <laughs> it's like like they should make you better they shouldn't just get out of your way yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think it's, I think they should support you, but also challenge you to be better. And, you know, when you just get on your way, are you going to actually grow because of that person um, to do this? And I, I, you know, I know a lot of people who have left organizations because they weren't getting mentorship. They weren't actually growing because of their leaders. And they went to a place that they knew would make them better. Right. Getting out of a person's way. Like, I, I understand the sentiment, but if that's the only characteristic, I'm a little bit nervous about it too. So before I do the definition, any initial thoughts on this idea of talent cultivator? Well, I love it. I think Abby Ramos. Danutes. Abby, Ra Abby Ramos Danutes, who is amazing. Um, thank you for teaching me how to say her last name. Yeah. And she is amazing. And I think in this section, right, she talks about like shine your light and then get out of my way. Like mm -hmm. that key element first, I think is so important in her story about shining, like a leader, a principal shining the light on strengths and then stepping aside and letting the teachers shine on their own. Yeah, you know, like there's, and partly, I, like I would say when I was a principal, I was never um, like a micromanager, uh, partly because I feel that it takes a lot of work and I'm a little bit lazy in some of aspects <laughs> of my life. So like, I like, like, if you, if you want to micromanage people, that's a lot of work, right? You want to put people in a position where they, you know, if you hire them to do an amazing job, let them do that job. Right. But also put them in a position where they get better because of your leadership. So talent cultivator pillar number three, this is the definition that we shared. Effective principals understand that the collective wisdom of their staff is the school's greatest asset. They recognize the strength in every staff member and support each team member and see their own strengths in identifying their next steps. Great principals not only shine a light on the talent among the staff, they create a culture where teachers recognize and celebrate each other's talents. Great principals know that when teachers feel supported, strong and powerful, they feel equipped to work through any challenge. Now, I'm gonna give you, if you haven't bought the book, I'm gonna do a little teaser right now. I share an amazing strategy. If you're new to a school on, on the importance of strengths, but I'm not gonna tell you, it. you're gonna have to get the book. So that's a little, that's a good idea. Is that a good idea? So it's we're, we're sharing, we're, share, we're like, everything we're sharing are kind of like additions to, but 
nothing we're sharing is as good as what we wrote in the book. <laughs> is that fair? Maybe. It's fair. It's no, we want to build, we want to, we want to provide some extra value, right? And whether you bought the book or not, we always appreciate people buying the book. You know, and people are in different situations where, you know, they can't get a book and that's okay, but this is totally free. And we want to discuss this and hopefully um, a principal group or people that are aspiring to be principals will watch these three or listen to these three together and have some discussions, uh, whether you buy the book or not. And so we want to do that because we, we really do believe how important that position is. We want people set for success. So one of the things on Talent Cultivator, Allison, I know you kind of mentioned you wanted to kind of expand on the teacher evaluation process and what you talked about there and why it's so important. So tell us more kind of how that aligns with Talent Cultivator. Because when people hear like, teacher evaluation, it's like, it's like not talent cultivator, it's life sucker. So that's how they right. kind of see that too. So how do you see that as, as part of cultivating talent? Well, I mean, I th first of all, just some realities about teacher evaluation systems, like research does not support their effectiveness. Like teacher evaluation systems are not linked to improve student outcomes at all. And actually are linked to um, like teacher dissatisfaction in their work. And as I, as a principal myself, as I visit so many different schools, one of the main ways principals get into teachers' classrooms is through observations that are done because of the evaluation system. Mm -hmm. So this is how we get into classrooms for extended periods of time, other than like just popping in and visiting. Mm -hmm. For the most part, across the country, every state has a requirement for teacher evaluation. It does not improve teacher effectiveness, research shows. So what can, how can we use this power for good instead of evil? I ask a question to teachers. I say, what makes a te what might make a teacher feel unsafe at school? And like nine times out of 10, teacher evaluation is one of the most frequent answers. Mm -hmm. I even ask, I've asked principals, what might make a teacher feel unsafe at school? And they said teacher evaluation. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I try not to get up on a soapbox, but I did in that moment. And I'm like, you guys, like the state says, here's the components of teacher evaluation. The state does not say how teacher evaluation needs to feel. Right. And it is an opportunity because we're getting into classrooms. We're going to be able to see teacher strengths, their next steps. It's an opportunity to utilize it as a platform to empower teachers, to recognize, not only for us to recognize their strengths, but the biggest compliment, I think, is that, you know, for a teacher to say, Allison saw this strength in me mm -hmm. and helped me believe it, believe in myself. Because then that lasts forever. That goes well beyond Allison's or any other principal's influence in your life. And then it can lead to this opportunity to um, just culture, cultivate the collective talent in the school. You know, we talk about collective efficacy and I love our shift in thinking in this chapter where we're talking about cultivating collective talent and mm -hmm. how to help teachers see and appreciate the, the strengths and talents in each other. And oh. just one more thing about teacher sure. evaluation is that, you know, I was not the master of all pedagogy at every single grade level, every single content area as a principal. And I am to evaluate pedagogy, instructional strategies in every content area and every grade level. So like sometimes we think, um, okay, we need to tell teachers to do more turn and talks or like improve student engagement with this like limited tool bag that each of us has. And I think we can go beyond that. I think we can help teachers be reflective educators through the evaluation process and really tap into like important questions rather than sharing strategies or ideas that we come up with let's mm -hmm. sit down and have a conversation of like all right what did you see like what do, what are your next steps how, how did you reflect on this lesson and then we can empower teachers through their reflection and provide additional strategies as they come up there there and i was going to interrupt you with a point you made that pushed my thinking and i'm I, and I, I know the book's right in front of me but i was like i'm trying to you said something that i like I slow read the book after it came out. So there's a very different between like reading it to learn and to enjoy versus like going through the editing process. And it really resonated with me was, and correct me, it might not even be in this chapter, I swear it is though, about like, basically it was like the difference between cultivating talent or like access, accessing talent. 
Oh yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Can you talk more about that for a second? Yeah. Cause I, I, that really stuck out to me. Like that actually, yeah. I, that's one of the things I love about writing this book. I was like, oh, God, I got to change how I talk. You know, I mean, that, that was like a really, I was like, that's a great way to kind of frame it. That was in reference to capacity. Right. So right. this is like, this is, is this where- in this chapter? Do I have to edit this out? <laughs> it I don't, I it's think, gonna I tap think... in. Don't, just keep going. I'm just teasing you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, words Bonus matter. Content. Yeah. <laughs> and how we talk about teachers really matters. It can build relationships. It can help them empower them, or it can be discouraging. And if somebody talks to me about building my capacity, hmm. I'm like, who are you to think you can build my capacity? Like I have capacity. And so we just change that conversation to how about we talk about supporting teachers and accessing the capacity that's already there. Like we're not building it. We're not like blowing air into them. We're helping them access the skills, the talents that they, they have within them. So this, this is, um, I, I'm actually in at California MTSS uh, keynoting that conference and it's coming up. It will be after this, this uh, keynote. So if you're in the uh, California area, I'll be there. I'm looking forward to it. One of the things I'll talk about there is one of my struggles with MTSS is not, the uh, is not the idea. It's sometimes our approach. And it's a lot of times we get a team together and say, hey, you know what, this kid sucks at this. Here's how mm -hmm. we're going to fix them. And what you're talking about with teacher evaluation is also part of the, how people feel at that. And kind of, it's like weird. Cause I didn't, this wasn't intentional, but I mentioned how none of these are, they're all kind of, they're all separate, but they all are connected. And I kind of brought that up. One of the things you kind of mentioned is about, you know, how principals get into classrooms, they do teacher evaluation things like that. You and I are both, we're very adamant that we're in classrooms all the time. So you wouldn't get that uptight feeling and people would feel comfortable and look at opportunities to kind of recognize some really great things and learn through the process. So I think to me, if you're only going into the classrooms to do evaluations, yeah, your teachers are going to be super tense and your kids aren't going to be, and they're, and by the way, they're going to totally fake. They're not going to do what they're really doing, but you're in there all the time. You just kind of get a feel because that was something that was really important to me. Get into the classrooms all the time. Like I would do, I would take my laptop. I would just knock off emails in a classroom sitting in the back and you're not going to get through them as quick, but you are going to build a lot of relationships with not only your staff, but your students that way, just kind of being there. And I'd always say to my staff, I'm not here to evaluate you, but I'm actually here to evaluate the environment we're putting you in to make sure that you have all the things that you need support. And I think if you're making decisions for the classroom, you got to be in those rooms. And one thing I didn't, this is like, I, I love this because um, building on what you said, this wasn't shared in the book, but it's something I've been advocating forever. I actually feel that teacher evaluation, part of the reason people struggle with it so much is because like, really, are you really as a, can you effectively evaluate going in to visit a couple of times what a teacher is really good at? Like it kind of feels fake and they're putting on a show and really who should be leading that conversation? Should it be the person who's doing the evaluating or, or the person who's actually being evaluated. So one of the things I really challenged was teachers actually developing their own portfolios and getting rid of some things saying like, Hey, we're going to actually have you lead your own portfolios on those seven attributes that the province or the state are saying are really important, but you tell us where you're strong. You tell us where you need to grow. And, and like, yeah, I'm going to come see you cause I have to, cause the district's making me, but I want you to say like, Hey, tell me where, tell me where you're strong and, and actually lead the conversation. And, and then actually tell me like where you need to grow and actually having them lead the conversation. I feel there's much better learning and there's much more ownership over the process. And not only did this really help them to identify their own strengths and areas of growth, it was a modeling of that's what we should be doing with students, right? Like, I don't know in Michigan versus like where I led schools in Alberta, what the difference is. But do you remember we had like parent teacher interviews and then they went to like student led conferences? Like, I don't know if you are familiar with that terminology, but it was like parents would come in, caregivers would come in, hey, your kid is like this, they need to do this, this, whatever. But then we shifted where students would come in with their families and they say, hey, here's something I'm doing, here's this. And they would lead the conversation and the learning becomes so much deeper. Right. And right. that's, I think we have to think, can we even read, like, as you mentioned, like, it's like, oh, I'm going to really recognize strengths in the evaluation. Well, why don't you actually get 
them to do that themselves and actually just kind of be a part of the conversation as opposed to leading it. The person leading the conversation typically is doing the most learning. And so I think that that to me is, is something that's really important. And like one of the things that I'm very passionate about and I kind of bring up and it ties into your idea beautifully is really, really kind of start with a strengths first approach. Like the best way to cultivate talent is to like access what's already there. Like writing the innovator's mindset it's like, hey, we want you to be innovative in this thing that you hate. <laughs> it's not a good approach, <laughs> right? Right. It's like, hey, you're really good at this. Like, how do we actually get you even better in this? And one of the simple strategies, and I, I don't know if it's simple, we had like um, professional learning that we had to do in our school based on uh, focus areas of the district, focus areas that we identified as a, as a staff. And instead of bringing outside presenters, I asked my own staff, to identify which one of these areas do you think you're really good at or you're passionate about? And what we want you to do is actually lead the professional learning for um, our community. Tell us, tell us how we, what are the measures are and, and also like shape the day for us. So that actually was really powerful because not only did staff feel valued, for their input, they didn't go to, I'm like, if you hate the area, don't go to that group. Do We don't want you going where you think you need to grow. We want you to go where, where you're really good. But the most important aspect was it was for me. And by the way, as the principal, I was an equal member in one of the groups. It wasn't like, you all go do this. It's like, I'm gonna be a part of this as well. And actually what was really powerful is that we were working on these focus areas and we weren't waiting for the expert to show up to our school. Oh, the expert is actually Susie in grade three. Like yeah. she's leading the PD on this. She's one of the team members because my biggest pet peeve in education by far is the whole, you can't be a prophet in your own land that someone with an accent has to show up to give you, you know, some learning of this when you actually have really amazing people too. So it's not just about cultivating talent and you recognizing it, but creating an environment where the community recognizes the talent that's in your own building, like across the hall. Like I always talk about this, it's amazing you can connect with people of the world. It doesn't mean much if you can't connect with people in your own community and really recognize that. So any thoughts on that? Oh my gosh, yes, so many, like 100%, everything that you just shared. Um, and the fortunate part of my work across schools across the country is that it's exactly what I get to do. It's not that I'm going in there as the expert. Allison Apsey knows everything. I get to go in there and support teachers in learning from each other. And that's mm -hmm. a beautiful thing. And I mean, it's not just our thinking. It's research supports that, um, you know, teacher collective efficacy, that um, self-efficacy, those pieces are crucial in order to move student achievement forward. Hey, so can I, and I asked you to do this in the book define collective efficacy and what does that mean it means um that you put me on the spot okay so yeah, that's good that's good that's the point of the podcast <laughs> yes yes um so it means that i know that i can better do my job that i can better impact student outcomes when i'm working alongside this team of teachers i'm a better teacher because of this team of teachers. And they're going to have strengths in areas that I'm not as strong. And if I can tap into those, my students are gonna benefit and vice versa. I love that. And I think that's a really important aspect. And we talk about this throughout the book, sort of the contributors is that like, you're not trying to get everyone in your organization to be like you. You're actually saying like, mm -hmm. how do we actually create spaces? And this was taught to me by Kelly Wilkins really where we bring in people with different talents and actually collectively, we actually create a much better environment because of our individual strengths. Uh, like I, I've talked about this forever. I, I really, I, I don't wanna say despise, but I actually am gonna say that, despise the overemphasis on collaboration and education. And it's not because I'm against collaboration, but I know that I work really well on my own as well. And I sure. don't really bring anything to the table if you don't give me time to think and time to process and then have something to contribute to the space. So that to me is like, do we also create a space where we have that opportunity to work on our yeah. own, think, you know, have some time to reflect that we then bring 
conversations, um, you know, we bring contributions to those tables. Cause like, typically if you go into a lot, like the little turn and talks that we have in groups of 10, it's always the same two people talking. And why is that? And often it's because people, a lot of people at that table, they just need time to process. And it's not that there's, yeah. they're not smart. They, they don't have anything to value. They just, they just need time. They just need right. time to think. So like, it's not that I'm against collaboration, but collaboration without actually isolation and, you know, independent thinking doesn't really work that well. So I, I think you and I are both like talent cultivating the biggest thing for us, I think in both of our chapters and, you know, kind of the approach is really focus on strengths and actually identify that. So I'm going to, I've been giving questions at the end of this um, for each one to just kind of consider and actually share. And you can share this, the hashtag, what makes a great principal um, in any different space. We'd love to hear for you. What is like maybe one strategy or method and you can talk like there might be some teachers list. I know there's some teachers list too, that you do this for either your staff or your students. How do you take an approach where you actually bring out the strengths in the people you serve? Because I think that's where, you know, if we can bring out the strengths in everyone, we are way stronger as a community, as opposed to continuously focus on what we're not doing well and trying to play educational whack-a-mole, which is a game we've right. played in education forever. So, um, Allison, I'll see you next week. Who knows? Yeah. We'll who knows if we'll be wearing the same outfits? Might do my hair different. I right. So I've been, I've been loving doing this with you. I love kind of diving in. I am, I will say this. I am so incredibly proud of this book. And not only because I actually thought I did a really good job. I'm not gonna lie. I'm very proud of what I wrote. You this. did. I, I thought you did and, a good job too. And I'm gonna say that a lot because we never share that we're proud of ourselves. But the reason why I share that about myself is I like loved writing this book. Every time I was writing for it, I was so excited. And then right reading your stuff, it really challenged my thinking. But I think both of you, I agree with this, the contributors of this book, um, the teachers who talked about great principles they had, it was a, like, both of us were like, ah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> I wish we would have had this book when we were principals, right? Yes. I think that was the best part of it. So um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on how you build strengths. If you haven't got a copy of what makes great, Great. What makes a great principal? Um, pick it up. The description, the link is in the description down below. Allison, I'll see you next week. Yeah, maybe I'll see you next week. So thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful day.